Good evening, everyone. My name is Marv Bolt, and I'm the Curator Emeritus of Science and Technology at the Corning Museum of Glass. I am delighted to host this week's episode of Connected by Glass, which focuses on the idea of election transparency. It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel. Ellery Fouch is Assistant Professor in American Studies at Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont. She teaches courses on American art and material culture, including the fascinating item that has spurred our conversation today, the 19th century glass ballot box. Our second guest, Mark Johnson, is a civil rights attorney in Kansas City. He teaches election law at the University of Kansas School of Law in Lawrence, Kansas. And he has been particularly involved in addressing the topic of voter suppression. As we get started, viewers and listeners, please remember that you can ask your questions on our YouTube or Facebook platforms at any time. That will get them in the queue, and our speakers will have the opportunity to respond to them in the concluding part of this episode. Although the topic of election transparency or any topic relating to elections can become contentious or highly partisan, we ask that questions and comments remain respectful and that they address matters specifically relating to transparency. We look forward to hear from you and to engage our panel with your thoughtful comments. Our conversation today began about two years ago when Professor Fouch contacted the Corning Museum of Glass about an unusual and intriguing object that she had been researching. This was the glass ballot box invented just prior to the American Civil War. So it's a technology that developed during the most divisive period in American history. Underlying our conversation this evening and the exhibition currently on view at the Corning Museum of Glass is a conviction that democracy can survive deep disagreements and that the desire for transparency in voting is a core value of this nation. And we are indebted to Professor Fouch for alerting us to this technology and for generously sharing her work with us so that we could develop this exhibition and structure our conversation today. I'll start with an observation about glass. New glass windows in our homes enable us to have an accurate, undistorted look at what's on the other side. And we take that for granted. When we look through old windows, though, we see distortions what we perceive doesn't accurately represent reality. When we look through newer glass windows, we expect that they won't distort or color what we see. In other words, we expect windows to be transparent. Likewise, in a free and democratic society, we expect an election, the entire election procedure, to be transparent from beginning to end so that the results do not distort the will of the people whether individually or as a nation. For over 150 years, since the mid 1800s, the voting process in the United States has tried to balance two competing goals. One, an overall election process that is transparent, and two, voting that is secret. These issues impact who gets to vote, how someone votes, and how votes get counted and they shape any efforts for election reform. And that leads us to the technology at the heart of today's conversation, the glass ballot box. Professor Fouch, could you please introduce us to this interesting innovation and invention and what it represented? Thanks, Marv. Um, I'm really happy to be here today and um, to see people tuning in. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, this. The ballot box, as you mentioned, came about at a time of intense uh, division in American society in a very contentious time, um, one that might sound familiar to today's listeners. Um, intense wealth disparity, um, a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment, a lot of tensions between politicians and the press around coverage of corruption scandals. Um, this really reached a height in San Francisco in 1856 when election, um, when politician, California politician, James Casey shot 
newspaper editor James King in cold blood on the streets of San Francisco. And the city and nation really erupted in alarm about what was happening. In the aftermath, um, this committee of vigilance formed in San Francisco and they issued their members medallions that really emphasized their responsibility for vigilance and oversight. Um, metaphors of vision and visibility and transparency became really important. As you can see here in the medallions, there's an all seeing eye of justice on the verso where the um, figure of justice who is usually blindfolded here is, has no, her view is unobstructed to oversee all that's happening. As part of their investigations, um, into widespread corruption, they found concrete evidence of election fraud, what was called the stuffer's ballot box. And I think we have an image of that here. Yeah, here we have um, a internal view of the workings. There were secret panels that would hide pre-marked ballots um, for the pre-selected candidate. Um, and the country just erupted in outrage over this over these machinations, over the attempts to suppress the will of the people, um, to not have their actual votes um, put the people in power. And as part of that, um, continued metaphors of visibility and transparency, concerns about this corruption um, overtook a lot of the rhetoric of the day. Um, people were concerned about absolutely, as the quote shows here, um, the ballot box becoming a medium of corruption, um, making where politicians could make the results they wanted. They would insert unauthorized ballots to outweigh and smother those honest, honestly deposited. Um, so this desire for a ballot box that would, and, a, and an electoral process that would make the will of the people heard was really important. In response, New Yorker seemed James, uh, sorry, Samuel Jolly presented himself with a flourish and presented the glass ballot box, um, which we'll see here. And that again, like the Committee on Vigilance, really used visibility and vision as a fulcrum of understanding ideas about justice, transparency, and fairness. So in the patent application, you see that as well, and I've included a quotation here. Jolly emphasized the, vi the process of vision and visibility. As he wrote, bystanders may see every ballot which is put in, see all the ballots that are in, and see them when taken out. It's a glass globe mounted in a frame to exhibit freely all that it contains. Bystanders can see the whole process of election from that casting of the ballot from the voter's hand into the chamber of votes and see when it is removed and counted by election progress. Um, officials. So this, um, this form is so striking to me too. It's this beautiful sculptural form that evokes so many icons of American um, democracy from the cross section of the Capitol building with its dome and columns, um, these beautiful twirling acanthus leaves, and really that shimmering sphere um, that could contain the will of the people, or so it was hoped. Um, and I think this emphasis on vision and visibility is uh, still with us when we try to discern um, how elections are being carried out. We might remember the election of 2000, um, the Florida infamous Florida recounts in which groups of people gathered about trying to examine and discern hanging chads, dimpled chads, trying by visual analysis to discern the will of the people, the intent of the voters. Um, so this this ballot, this glass ballot box was really the, in opposition to the stuffer's ballot box. And it evokes, just as the dimpled chad or hanging chad might, these fears and hopes about democracy and its possibilities, um, a way of transmitting the will of the people. So we have a, uh, a technology, the glass ballot box, that stands for the first of our two competing goals. But we've also got a technology for addressing that second goal. Uh, Mark, do you uh, have a few slides for us for that? Sure, Mark. Thanks so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, this evening. Uh, I'm going to start first by showing you a painting 
by the famous Missouri, when I say Missouri, rather than Missouri, uh, Missouri painter George Caleb Bingham, who in the mid 1850s did a series of four paintings focusing on the electoral process in our part of the country, out in, uh, in, in, in the rural parts of Missouri at the time. The most famous of them is the painting that I'm showing you here. It's called The County Election. And this is, a, this is a depiction of an election that actually occurred. How do we know that? Because Bingham himself was a candidate in this election. It occurred in 1850. The painting uh, he did in 1854, but you can see Bingham, he is the character who is sitting in the middle of the painting on the bottom step, appearing, apparently looking at a book. Uh, so that's the, that's the painter himself. His opponent is the guy who, is, uh, who has a top hat who is talking to the voter who is next in line to vote, handing him his card. So he's trying to get the sort of the last word in. But what this painting shows us is a process that is absolutely transparent. Everything involved in the electoral process is there, including the vote itself. You'll see at the top of the steps, uh, a, a, a man in a red shirt who has his right hand on a Bible uh, and in front of him is a judge. And what this, what this individual is doing is swearing that he has not yet voted. So once he finishes that, he will vote and he will vote orally. So everybody can hear who he's voting for. And then it's recorded by the clerks who are sitting behind the judge. So we have a process that is completely transparent and unfortunately uh, quite vulnerable to fraud, to votes being bought. How do we, and, and how does the person buying the vote knows the vote's bought? Because he hears or she hears the voter actually saying who, who they're, they're voting for. And so this was perceived as a big problem, as you might expect. And so the idea of secrecy became something that came to the fore, and you'll see this in the next slide. This is a cartoon that appeared in a newspaper in England uh, in the 1890s. Uh, and what it shows is what has become known as the Australian ballot process. Uh, it was pioneered in Australia, in, in uh, Victoria, in the 1850s. Uh, and it em embodies nearly all of what we see in our voting process today. You see transparency. You see the, the voter getting the ballot, going to a, a, a polling booth, filling out the ballot, walking back to the, uh, the table where the election judges are and putting the ballot in the ballot box. So you see the, the process take place, but the most, perhaps the most important point is you see secrecy as well. The ballot marked by the voter is secret. No one sees who he, and at the time, it was all men who voted. Women did not have suffrage, did not have suffrage in the United States uh, un until the late 1800s in a number of states. And of course, uh, not in, uh, in federal elections until the uh, uh, until 1920 with a with an amendment to the Constitution. But what you see here, to, uh, you, you see in this cartoon, is the process that swept the country, swept the United States in the late 1880s and the early 1890s. So you, we went from a process uh, that you, you saw in the painting, in the, in the Bingham painting, where everything is out, done out in the open, to a process where you have a combination of both transparency and secrecy in a, in a voting process that we still use today. If you, you look at where, how this is laid out, and how the polling place that you're gonna go into in November, if you vote in person, the features, the basic features are practically identical. So not so much a change in technology, a change in process brought secrecy to the electoral process in the United States. So that's a great cartoon. And let's take a look at a few more cartoons. Uh, Professor Fouch, you've found dozens of cartoons in which the glass ballot box represents the idea of transparency and fairness in elections. Uh, perhaps you could show us uh, one or two of your favorite examples and why they are uh, your favorites. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the, some of the cartoons that I especially love are ones that evoke the force of the will of the people, the voice of the people in unseating corruption. Um, so we've brought in two different examples of that here on the left, um, this ballot box weather vane atop a smoke a smokestack that's labeled public common sense. Um, the free ballots have gathered such force that they are really erupting uh, the corrupt politicians into the four corners of the earth. Um, and here it's labeled an American invention for blowing up bosses, which uh, evokes this kind of explosive possibility of the will of the people, um, the revolutionary notion um, of unseating uh, corrupt politicians through uh, transparent elections. And I think too, um, I didn't say this in my introduction, but one of the popularly understood um, properties of glass in the 19th century, even among the general public, um, was its neutrality. It's as a medium, it's also used for chemo chemistry and chemical glassware. Um, so this almost evokes the kind of round bottom flask or a Leiden jar that can hold a vault, a vault um, and not be corroded um, by impure materials. Um, it's neutral, it won't disturb the contents. That's one of the things I, I love too about this kind of double meaning of uh, the ballot box as a chamber that will unload its charge. Um, on the right, there's a very uh, different kind of explosion. Uh, the personified muscle bound ballot box um, who when the wind blows, the cradle will fall. Um, here, the voice of the people is a gust of wind that knocks uh, the corrupt spoils from the tree. Um, and I, I love this ballot, this um, personified Herculean ballot box also because he evokes the labor of the glass makers who worked to blow the glass, um, the glass spheres for the election. Um, and so this, this, these kind of double meanings are there as well for me. Thanks. And in fact, the uh, the one on the right is included in the exhibition uh, as well. So when you come to visit, uh, please check that one out. And uh, Professor Johnson, you've selected uh, some cartoons as well, I believe. I have, and, uh, and, and thank you. Uh, and the, the first two I want to share with you are actually of ballots uh, that were used in the 1860s. Now, as Professor Fouch indicated, the glass ballot box had come into use uh, in the United States and the idea being a transparent process. You can't stuff the ballot box anymore because all of the ballots are visible. And, you, know, you can see every ballot that's in the box. So what, but that still didn't deal with the issue of secrecy. What happened in the 1860s was that we, we saw uh, pre-printed ballots uh, some people couldn't read, some people didn't have the time to learn who were they, were they were supposed to vote for if they were, you know, they lived in certain parts of town where the, uh, where everybody's vote, supposed to vote for one candidate. And so the parties pre-printed ballots and handed them to voters as they went into the, uh, the polling station, and the voter would then put the ballot directly into the ballot box. What I, I show you with this slide are distinct ballot designs. And so even though the, uh, you know, even though the, you know, the ballots could be seen, it was a transparent process. The problem was, sorry, the ballots could be seen. Uh, and so everybody could see who people were voting for by simply what ballot they put into the glass ballot box. And then let's look at the second one, which is an even simpler way of uh, indicating who you're voting for, the parties would have different colored ballots. So if you wanted to vote for the Republican ticket, as you can see here on the, uh, in, uh, well, all, uh, pardon me, all three of these are uh, for, uh, for the Republican ticket, different election, they, the Republican party uh, uh, people would hand the voter the ballot, walk into the ballot station and put it in, into the globe and everybody would see who the person voted for. The Democratic Party did the same thing. It was something that was a very common practice. And so even though uh, you know, transparency was brought to the process 
by the glass ballot box, you still had the problem with voter fraud or you know, fraudulent elections, because as you see, you know, you, this is an example of one of those glass ballot boxes, and it's got the, you know, the little little slit at the top through which you 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 put the ballot, and everybody in the in the polling station could see who the uh, the voters were voting for based on what which ballot they put into the box. So, and the, and the last cartoon I have here is of one of the first actual secret ballots. You can see this is from 1893. This is from an election that took place in New York. Uh, and um, it allowed the voter uh, to be given the blank ballot, go into the polling booth, secret polling booth, and by using a pencil, mark the, uh, you know, fill, fill it, you know, put an X in, in the box or, or uh, fill, fill in the box next to the name of the candidate that he or she wanted, or pardon me, he wanted to vote for. Uh, and then you can see it also gave the option of voting a straight ticket. Democratic or Republican, something again that was very common at the time. And once the voter finished voting, he would fold the ballot, turn around, walk over to the table where the ballot box was. And even if it was a glass globe, because you had a standardized ballot, nobody would know who the, the, the voter was voting for because he would simply put it into the slot, it would drop into the, the ballot box and you would see the ballot box filled with folded pieces of paper of the same color. No design on the outside, so you couldn't tell who the individual was voting for. So this is, the, you know, here's a, an example in about 20 years of going from a voting process, I mean, using the same ballot type of ballot box, the glass ballot box, but with a change in the voting process going from a, an, an from a, a completely open balloting process to one that was secret, simply by using different pieces of paper. So the technology uh, that was supposed to be, bring transparency didn't necessarily bring transparency. And I think- well, and uh, The reality is it brought too much transparency. Uh, and you know, the second innovation of the, uh, of the standardized anonymous ballot had to, had to uh, uh, be instituted as well. And there are other problems with transparency as well, I believe, Professor Fouch, you have a few uh, slides to show us on that. I managed to mute myself. Oh, technology, um, speaking of technologies. They, uh, people were very, some people were very optimistic about the, um, promises of the glass ballot box and the hope that it could eliminate corruption. But absolutely, as you can see in this cartoon that features the infamous boss Tweed standing very casually next to um, the ballot box, whose spherical form really <laughs> mirrors that of his belly, um, he pointed out in counting, there is strength. It doesn't matter if you can see all the ballots, if you have people in the back counting them the way the results want um the way they want the results to be um so as caption here as long as i count the votes what are you going to do about it eh um and this was something that a lot of people were concerned about the um fact that the ballots were often counted in secret or the tallies were kept on a slate um that could be erased or manipulated in other ways we might hear um echoes of similar concerns about uh, electronic voting and the lack of a paper trail in some ways. So there were some cartoons that uh, that evoked the hopes and then others that that spoke to this moment in which people realized it wasn't a fail safe method. Um, if we go back, I think there's a slide 28 um, to if we can. There we go. Um, I love this this set of cartoons because you have the figure of Columbia um pointing to how the ballot box has crushed the political corruption um these squashed figures of boss tweed and other tammany compatriots way uh completely smushed under the weight of the ballot box ballots being mightier than bullets as uncle sam pastes on the wall but on the right you still see um with this political cartoon 
money was still a huge problem in politics, the concern that um, people could, people's votes could still be bought um, in this way, despite secrecy. Um, the next cartoon shows this, I think, even more uh, definitively. You have Uncle Sam trying to deposit the will of the people in the glass ballot box, um, but a snake rises up and the body of the snake is inscribed, purchased votes. Um, so this was continued to be an ongoing problem um, in, in society. It wasn't immediately solved. We also see um, uh, ballots, not bullets was evoked in the um, earlier cartoon. We see here this kind of the violence that was still tenable or unleashed in many of these uh, conflicts. The Tammany Tiger Loose here attacks and mauls uh, the figure of justice with the broken ballot box behind her shattered. Um, and so these concerns of violence were very real. Um, and that's maybe another association people often have with glass, maybe not Corning folks who are very familiar with its uh, strength and durability. People were at pains to point out that it was very thick glass that could withstand the shot of a pistol. Um, and yet, human bodies were still vulnerable and voter intimidation was a huge problem in this period as well. Um, as seen in both uh, newspaper illustrations that were supposed to be repertorial, straightforward accounts of what was happening at the polls and in political cartoons like this one, which ominously reads, everything points to a democratic victory this fall. Um, you can see here the election supervisors on the right or on the left of the image is the whites white voters entrance. They are allowed unimpeded um, on the right. A black man doffs his hat, is prepared to vote, and is met instead with the pistol um, of a man at the table who turns him away. So even if you counted the votes, even if the votes were all there, if people were denied this vote, that was um, voter intimidation and outright violence um, were huge problems. We, can, we see another example of that here in a more allegorical sense, um, but concerns during Reconstruction about keeping peace at the polls and allowing access um, for Black voters who were newly enfranchised, Black male voters, of course. Um, here you see the changing of the guard um, where a former Union soldier is getting ready to depart his post at the ballot box labeled an honest ballot box, equal rights for all, but he's being relieved by a soldier who we can see is carrying a cartridge box that is marked CSA. This is a Confederate um, veteran. The upturned brim of his hat reads KKK. And so here are the very officials who are supposed to uphold a free and fair election are themselves um, very invested in voter suppression, especially suppressing the black vote and in systems of white supremacy. So that leads it. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Mark but I just make, make one comment there. The, the, uh, the, the past few cartoons that Professor Fouch has talked about were uh, uh, largely uh, surround the events in the 1870s that culminated with the, the, with the infamous election of 1876 when Rutherford B. Hayes was elected, even though he lost the popular vote to Samuel Tilden. Uh, and it's long been believed that one of the reasons that Hayes won the election, a Republican, was that he agreed to bring an end to Reconstruction, to withdraw all of the Northern forces who were occupying the South. Uh, and another interesting point from one of the cartoons that shows the African-American voters being denied access, they largely voted Republican because uh, Abraham Lincoln had freed them uh, and it was, uh, and, and and African Americans voted Republican for quite a long time, but because of that, it wasn't until uh, the 1930s with the New Deal that they really f flipped to being largely Democratic. And so that's why this cartoon says that in 1874, it looks like it's gonna be a Democratic win uh, because the Republican African American voters are being shut out. So even with the transparent voting process, you can see that at the time, and this has been all too evident throughout American history, is that things are happening behind, you know, behind closed doors to 
uh, to uh, bring about, uh, pardon me, bring about fraudulent uh, and dishonest results in elections. Yeah, the next uh, cartoon we're going to take a look at uh, picks up on this idea, and it's my favorite cartoon uh, in, in the exhibition as well. It's called The Hyphenated American. And if you look at this closely, you'll see people are lining up to vote, and they are drawn with two labels and some uh, stereotypical clothing that reflects two different nationalities. On their right side, you'll see their nation of origin. And on their left side is a label indicating their status as Americans. So each of these bodies caricatures a division implying uh, divided loyalty. So in order, you'll see first an Irish American indicated by a uh, shamrock and a uh, what can only be described as a monkeyish face. Then we have a German American with a pipe, a farmer's hat, and Dutch wooden shoes. Then presumably an English American with a top hat and a large mustache, an Italian American with a stylish hat and feather and, and so on. And the caption reads, the hyphenated American, why should I let these freaks cast full votes when they are only half American? It's a cartoon that could have been drawn this morning. In fact, it's from 1899. So I'm wondering if each of you could comment on this cartoon from your perspective of your own research and work. And we'll begin with you, Mark. Thanks, Barb. I, th this is just a wonderful cartoon. It's a great illustration of something that's been present in, present in American politics since the founding of the Republic. We today call it identity politics. And it, it, and it focuses on not who somebody is, but what they are. Where do they come from? It started all the way back in the 1790s, when the, you know, right after the country was founded, where, when thousands and thousands of uh, refugees from the French Revolution and from, uh, from Scotland and Ireland came to the United States and fear arose among the so-called, you know, the, the, the people in power in, in, the, in the US that once these people became citizens after spending the you know, appropriate period of time in the US, they would vote, you know, they would vote their people in and vote the, uh, you know, the founders of the country out. So that's one of the reasons for the passage of the infamous Alien and Sedition Acts in 1798. Among other things, they greatly extended the amount of the number of years somebody had to be in the U.S. before they, they could be naturalized. But this this idea of identity politics is something we've had ever since, from the, the know-nothings in the pre-Civil War era to the uh, immigration quotas uh, against Asians uh, in the late 1800s to the uh, post-World War II immigration uh, limitations uh, that le led to lotteries actually being conducted among people who wanted to come to the United States. And of course, today, uh, you know, we, the, the administration has greatly reduced the number of people who are allowed to immigrate to the United States. And to a great degree, it's because of a nativist fear of what will happen when those people become citizens. They will vote against the powers, if you will, that tried to keep them out. So this cartoon is a wonderful illustration. It's, it's a fantastic illustration of something we've had to deal with for the entire duration uh, of the, you know, since the Republic was founded. Thanks, Mark. Um, Ellery, any thoughts specific to this cartoon? Yeah, I don't know that I have um, a, a ton to add to the reading of this uh, really powerful image. Um, I do think one important aspect is that um, Uncle Sam here is looking so uh, dismissive and angry about the approach of these voters, and he actually calls them freaks. Um, in a lot of the cartoons, you see Uncle Sam staunchly defending people who are trying to vote. Um, in one, he's dressed up as a policeman, um, kind of trying to keep those that would corrupt out and, and usher in uh, voters. We'll see more cartoons with Uncle Sam later, I think. Um, and in this, this, uh, this hyphenated American um, an invocation of the freak 
also brings up the specter of P.T. Barnum and the freak shows and dime museums of the late 19th century, um, which were also often really obsessed with discernment and um, believability of about is seeing believing and often featured people um, with what the scholar and uh, disability rights activist Rosemary Garland Thompson has described as extraordinary bodies. Um, and this cartoon in particular, I think evokes the, um, the extraordinary body of the half man, half woman figure who was often a part of this display. People um, like uh, the person with the stage name, Josephine Joseph, um, who dressed half as man, half as a female. And the, these, um, these folks were seen as embodying dualities or binaries like a bearded lady, what we're seen as contradictions. And so I think it's really interesting that the whole person isn't honored in this image in this way, the way that a, an immigrant identity uh, could be a whole complex multitude, but not a divided one, not a divided loyalty. Yeah, Marv, can I make one more comment? Uh, and it's about the, the obvious hypocrisy of, of this cartoon. You see the Irish American first in line. Well, that doesn't reflect the fact, and Uncle Sam is not acknowledging the fact that fully a quarter, a quarter of the men who had served in the Union Army in the Civil War were not only of Irish extraction, they had been born in Ireland. So it can, it, it, the case can be made that the North won the Civil War because of Irish immigrants. And here we, you see a cartoon that mocks them. It's, uh, it's an interesting commentary, if nothing else. All of oh. these works that denigrate the contributions of immigrants to American society are really, I think, troubling and problematic, absolutely. And in conversation with the ways in which in the 19th century, it was a much sped up process to achieve naturalization um, or on election day, someone could sponsor you and you could suddenly be able to vote. So I think that's also a key tension there. I'm going to slightly shift directions as this year marks the 100th anniversary of the legal right for women to vote, or more precisely, the right of some women to vote. Uh, Professor Johnson, could you comment uh, on the connections between election transparency and suffrage, the legal right to vote? Of course. Uh, the, one of the other innovations for the Australian ballot uh, was the public voter list and the uh, sort of standard uh, design of the, of the polling place. When you go in to vote, the first thing you do is check in with an election judge and that election judge looks at a list, whether it's on paper or on computer, to make sure that you've registered to vote. That is a public list. If that list didn't exist, you wouldn't know if you were uh, in, you know, legally entitled, pardon me, entitled to vote. And it's a part of the transparent process. That list is available to anyone. Political parties use those quite commonly. And then if you, you look here at this slide, it shows you a contemporary standard design of a polling place. And everybody who's watching this, when you look at it, you'll probably say to yourselves, oh yes, I see that looks just like wh where I vote. You know, the details might be slightly different, but the basic design is the same. You see a, you know, an entrance and an exit. You see a flow so people don't, you know, you know, they don't have to walk across themselves. You enter and you leave having sort of all, always walked in one direction. You, you, you pick up your ballot at the registration table. There are observers from the political parties there to make sure that the process is going as it should. You walk to your polling booth, you fill out the, the ballot you walk to the ballot box and each of these steps is, uh, is supervised by an election official. You drop your ballot in the ballot box and you leave. So the, the, the idea of suffrage, which is just you know, voting, uh, is uh, it, it's a public process. Uh, and and that's, that, that's extremely important. Uh, and the 
Uh, perhaps the most important thing about all this is that when we walk into a polling place, we see what we expect to see. We, because we've done it before, or if we haven't done it before, we know people who have, uh, and with the, the standardized design, there's less confusion uh, with the process. So the, again, you know, the focus is on transparency and meeting and fulfilling expectations, the voters' expectations. So that's why I wanted to show you, the, you know, these two slides so you get a sense that exercising the vote is based largely on a transparent process with one little sec you know, secret element, and that's the actual ballot. Thank you. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of the polling station itself as being a transparent medium and transparent technology. So that sketch was very, very uh, helpful for that. If you go, you go back and look at the cartoon from the English newspaper, uh, go, go back, uh, what, one more? Eh, I'm sorry. You have to go back to number two. Uh, that's, that shows this one, exactly. Now, if you look at that, and this is 130 or so years ago, you will see the exact, exactly the same elements as you will in a polling place today. Down to the, what looks like a little fence in front, that bar that shows this, you know, inside this fence is the voting enclosure. The only people allowed inside this little fence are the voters and the people who are involved in the voting process. Candidates are not allowed in, their supporters are not allowed in, and for one reason, because if you did, they would follow you into the polling booth and the, you know, the secrecy of the ballot would be lost. So 1890 to 2020, the process is basically the same. It's an interesting example of that tension between those two goals of transparency and secrecy and how that, that plays out there. Thank you. Professor Fouch, some examples that, uh, that you've selected. <laughs> uh, sure, more about um, suffrage. While the process might be the same, the people who can cast the votes is radically uh, different as we've acknowledged. Um, and one of the things I find really uh, interesting about political cartoons and their deployment of the ballot box are the ways in which it um, they alternately mock or glorify potential voters. Um, here, another caricature of an Irish person, here an Irish washerwoman, um, for whom the processes of voting were inscrutable and opaque. Um, she doesn't understand the workings of the ballot box and instead is scrubbing it in um, her attempts to purify it. So this quote, women will pur purify the ballot box, um, was one that was used by many advocates for female suffrage um, who pointed to immigrants who could vote, who pointed to uh, former convicted prisoners who could vote um, and said, ah, oh, the cult of true womanhood tells us that women are um, more pure, they have higher values and better morals, and therefore if they can vote, the United States will be a better, more just society. Um, and of course, many people thought that was bunk. And we see this, um, this Irish washerwoman taking the purity of the ballot box as a literal cleanliness. And so she's scrubbing the ballot box with her bristle brush, with boiling water, with baking soda, to the point in which it cracks. Other people pointed to um, these kind of notions of literal cleanliness as um, women's work, but women's work that was about improving society. On the right, um, the feminist cartoonist Lou Rogers writes, from force of habit, she'll clean this up. And it shows uh, the municipal ballot as full of cobwebs and dripping with grime and social evils. Um, and instead, this woman determinedly faces this enormous mess with her mop. She'll clean it up. Um, in a prior cartoon, I think that was slide 36, um, again, the actions of cleaning were seen as noble, good work about uh, 
making the world a better place, using reform soap as it's labeled there to clean up the corruption and uh, the kind of villainy. Uh, Columbia here has a steaming bucket of hot water and a scrub bus. She's, she's ready to clear that judge's bench. Um, Uncle Sam has rolled up his sleeves and is also taking the ballot box for a good soak. Um, and so this, this notion of cleanliness and cleaning up corruption was really clear. But I think um, as we'll also see in, in other slides um, like 38, even as female voters were mocked or vilified, potential uh, female voters, others were sometimes glamorized. Um, this image from the San Francisco Daily Call shows a very glamorous Art Nouveau kind of stylized woman holding aloft both a baby's cradle and the ballot box, showing that the woman will not abandon her motherly duties. Um, so many caricatures of female suffragists gave them mannish qualities, um, suggesting that they would um, kind of be transformed by this brute political power and the rough and tumble of the um, electoral sphere. And instead, many cartoons wished to, and illustrations wished to convey that women were ready to take on this responsibility. Um, if we move ahead to, let's see, <laughs> this is a funny one. Um, if we move to actually cartoon uh, slide number 40, maybe, and then we'll come back to this one. Um, the kind of nobility and seriousness of the vote is there. A, a little boy is asking his father, a vote for mother is a vote for a better world for me, um, holding aloft the ballot box for suffrage. And on the right, women holding as the wise women of the West instead of the Magi, um, holding flags of loyalty. The ballot box is here labeled power, um, a very, very serious concerns as well. Um, if you want, we can go back to the other, um, the one that we were at just a few seconds ago with the, yeah. Um, this cartoon also is a, a good one in terms of the representations of suffragists in the UK versus the US. Um, Jonathan may be in more danger than John. Um, the idea that Uncle Sam or Jonathan, as he was sometimes called here, he's surrounded by fashionable suffragettes who flirt with him, who kind of um, try to tease access to the ballot from him versus John Bull, the representation of the UK in the background, he's being badgered and hammered by suffragettes with their plaid skirts and their umbrellas who kind of try to beat him into submission into giving them access. Um, so I think these tensions about um, the seriousness of voting and how women could use that right um, are seen from Valentines um, that were both pro and anti-suffrage um, or sheet music that represented women as very fashionable uh, new voters with their new rights. That's I think slide 46. We have um, a illustration I just recently discovered this uh, illustration for sheet music to the tune, when Helen casts her ballot, um, and she's so elegantly depositing her vote in the slot, participating in democracy um, as well. Marv, if I, could, if, if I could interject one comment, what, one of the, as you might know, many of the states had allowed women to vote in advance, you know, before the, the constitu constitution was amended to uh, uh, allow women to vote in federal elections. Uh, in Kansas, for example, they were al allowed to vote in state elections in the early 1890s. And one of the uh, observations uh, that, that, that people uh, drew from women uh, voting in elections was that election day conduct, particularly what happened inside the polling station, became much less violent uh, you know, it was, it was much calmer. Uh, and the idea was that the presence of women made the process run more smoothly because the men couldn't get away with the stuff that they were used to getting away with. Uh, uh, and, and um, you know, you can, you can see that in some of, of the cartoons. Now, that wasn't necessarily the, the reason that they were, uh, they were finally given the vote. 
uh, in, the, you know, in the teens, 19 teens, but certainly it contributed to that. The idea that they would, they would help foster a much uh, smoother voting process. Thank you. And we're going to go to our uh, wrap up question so that we can take a couple of questions from, uh, from our listeners. So we've looked at a lot of topics surrounding the idea of election transparency and wondering if you have uh, any concluding comments, either from history or from the present, that we might want to reflect on in, uh, in the next month. And we'll begin with you, Ellery. Uh, thank you, Marv. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately are the, um, the kind of most recent addition to ballot box technology, which would be um, the ballot box drop boxes um, that have sprung up. And I think I brought in some images of those, um, for example, in slide 67, I think we have. There we go. Um, yeah, the ways in which concerns about the infrastructure of the US Postal Service, which has been, uh, there were many attempts to dismantle parts, mail sorting machines were taken out of commission um, and things like that. Concerns over the US Postal Service's ability to handle the number of absentee ballots that would come in as part of um, people avoiding the polls due to COVID um, led to this emphasis on the, the new ballot drop box. Um, and there are these specially designed ones, as you can see here, some press photos. Um, in Philadelphia, in the next slide, you see that they've adapted actual post boxes into election drop boxes with this kind of over the top patriotic gear to indicate that this is for ballots, not um, regular mail. It reminds me of in Philadelphia, they adapt the dump trucks to be uh, snow plows in the scene. So this kind of adaptive reuse of limited resources. Um, but there are also other companies that have gotten in on the action. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, absolutely. A company um, called LaserFab has started doing a line of ballot boxes seen here called Vote Armor, which I think is a really fascinating name for the um, evocations of military might and the defense of elections um, that are that are called for in this time. Um, the Vote Armor logo evokes both the check mark of, um, of the ballot, of the old school ballot, not the fill in the bubble that we have for Scantrons today, um, but also that kind of stocky, um, stocky stability that we look for. Um, and then they've also, some of their ads talk about the durability and how strong they are, how much they can withstand. Um, on the left, part of their advertising material talks about how they cast the legs in concrete um, to keep them from being removed. They have, uh, as I think you can see in the bottom left, uh, fire suppression canisters included in the box. And they actually put out publicity about how it could even withstand an accidental crash, an SUV here. Um, crashed into a Thurston County, Washington um, ballot box. And they were quick to point out none of the ballots were lost or harmed in the process. Um, and so I think this is a really interesting object that speaks to our current concerns, our current historical moment and context and fears about the will of the people being represented in the election. Thank you. Mark, concluding comments? Thank you. Uh, I, I, a couple of comments. First. Uh, I believe that uh, we're going to see more and more of the, of the drop boxes as time goes on. Uh, unfortunately, this year with the pandemic, uh, the move to increase the number of ballot boxes, and I'm involved in some lawsuits uh, involving that, it's, it's just, it, it was just a little bit too late. Uh, I think what we're going to see in the next two, four, six years are standardized designs of these boxes. They'll become far more acceptable. They'll, they'll just become part of the political process. But the, the final thought I have is that all of the innovations, um, all of the technologies, all of the changes in, in, the, in the voting process that we've seen in the past 200 years are aimed at two things. First, accurate results. That 
you know, the, the people who vote, their votes are counted, they're added up properly, everything's tabulated properly. So the numbers that you get are actually as close as possible to the, the you know, to, to the real numbers. That's number one. But just as important, number two is credible results, that the people believe that the results are accurate. And I think you understand that accurate results and credible results can be two different things. We have to have both accuracy and credibility for a reliable election process and for peaceful trans uh, transitions of power. In, in, in US history, we have never had a transition of power where you saw tanks in the street. 1876, we came pretty close to it, but it's never happened. And with a process that we all believe yields accurate results, it never will happen. Thank you, Mark. And that's just the right segue to uh, one of the questions that's come in from uh, a listener who says, do you think there is a suggestion in these comics of voting as a kind of performance? Ellery, let's, let's start with you. Great. Um, yeah, I think there is an aspect, absolutely. Uh, you especially see this in uh, more of the historical illustrations where people are very self-consciously playing a role in society and taking seriously um, this responsibility, especially as uh, suffrage was a right that was so hard fought um, with generations of activists lobbying for the right to, to vote, um, especially for um, Black suffrage, for women's suffrage, and more. Um, and so I, I think people, many of the, of the cartoons and illustrations give this sense of the gravitas of the experience and the procedure, which is very different. Um, I think especially the architectural forms of the ballot box encourage that as well. It's very different from my experience, at least at my polling place, going in with a Sharpie that has a plastic utensil uh, taped to it so that you don't take the marker on your way out the door with these kind of temporary um, dividers in between that can all be folded down really easily. But I think absolutely there's a kind of theatricality and a, a sense of performing your patriotic duty, not in a, a theatrical way, but in a very solemn, real sense. Mark, a uh, question for you. Sure. Do you think we could see the return of glass to elections in the future? Well, if you're talking about a glass ballot box, why not? I thought, number one, they're beautiful. Uh, and number two, they are totally transparent. I mean, it, 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 it's completely consistent with the kind of process that we want to have, at least you know, philosophically, we want a process everybody understands, everybody sees. It's, you know, it's a performance. How can you see the performance without actually seeing the results of the performance? And that's the ballot. No, I, I, I think it would be a great idea. I think some might argue at Corning, especially that um, electronic machines are mediated um, by glass, by fiberglass cables. And when we watch the election results, so many of us are watching on glass screens. Um, well, I, it, it, but I, I think that the days of of electronic voting, of touch screen touch screen voting, uh, are on the way out. Uh, it's it's a process that many people have never really understood and have become comfortable with, uh, and and now that uh, most of the states are mandating that there be a paper uh, paper trail. I, many states are simply saying, why should we buy these expensive and somewhat unreliable voting machines if we're just going to go back to paper ballots? An excellent way to end our, our session. So I want to thank our guests, Ellery Fouch and Mark Johnson. To those tuning in, we're sorry if we did not get to address some form of your question today, but we thank you for your interest and participation. We invite and encourage each of you to participate in this year's election process and to make it as transparent as possible. For those of you living in New York, please note that New York State voter registration ends next week, Friday, October 9. 
for listeners and viewers in other regions, please check your own state's requirements if you have not yet registered to vote. This episode of Connected by Glass will be added to the Corning Museum of Glass YouTube channel, along with all the other episodes, which have covered a wide range of topics. And if you are enjoying Connected by Glass, please consider supporting the Corning Museum of Glass so we can continue to bring you compelling content. Our next episode will focus on Stuben Glass, and we'll hear from some of the designers behind the beloved brand. Mark your calendars for October 29 at 7 p.m. That's just before Halloween and before the election. So October 29 at 7 p.m. Look for more details on our social media soon. We hope you've been inspired to see glass in a new way. In this case, to see how glass can represent a fundamental characteristic of a free and democratic society. We invite you to explore the exciting world of glass at the Corning Museum of Glass and to see our new exhibit, Transparent Voting in America. Please head to our website at cmog.org, that's cmog.org, to plan your upcoming visit soon. Thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone.